My name is Nemo Basi. I'm from Nigeria. I work with Environmental Rights Action, which is the Nigerian chapter of Friends of the Earth International. Okay. And what are you doing here in Cancun? Well, I'm here as part of Friends of the Earth International delegation uh, to push our demands for climate justice and to speak to policymakers and delegates to ensure that they understand that climate change is not a thing to play politics with and also that coming here is not like going to a stock exchange. <laughs> it's not like going to a stock exchange? What do you mean by that? Uh, you know, it is very unfortunate that when you follow the discussions of climate change, delegates from virtually every nation, not all nations, but most nations are here to give as little as they can than to get as much as they can get. So there are people who are here mainly to make deals to have money through carbon trading, through all kinds of policies that are being drawn up. And there are some who are here to ensure that they don't actually commit to reduce uh, uh, emissions. And so they come here with no promise at all. They want, but they want everybody to go home feeling that something has happened. I know it doesn't happen like this in the financial stock exchange, you know, because everybody wants to make a profit, although some people lose. But here, a few people really are here to ensure that they don't put anything on the table. And some others, unfortunately, are here to see that they can get as much as they can get. At the end of the day, everybody loses. Nobody gets anything. What's the biggest issue in layman's terms on the table here? Um, I, if I want to look at the whole range of issues, I think the most critical thing about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is getting the big polluters to agree to reduce on their polluting activities. In other words, getting the rich countries to ad agree to make a binding commitment to reduce emissions at a significant level. The language they use is ambition, but we don't see any ambition at all. Do you think there's any hope of that here? Um, I would be very optimistic if I should say that at the end of two weeks, there would be any, any real commitment on the table from the polluting countries. The United States, for example, is not ready to make any real, definite, serious commitment to cut emissions. Now, there seems to be a big difference between the developing nations and the developed nations in this whole climate debate. Can you give me a bit of uh, Africa's perspective on that? Uh, well, Africa is the continent that has contributed the least to the problems of global warming. At the climate debate or negotiations, the, the difference between poor, vulnerable regions and the rich regions cannot be any more wider. When you take the example of Africa, Africa is the least contributor to global warming in terms of the introduction of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and it is also the most vulnerable continent in terms of the imp what the impact would be if there should be any significant temperature increase above pre-industrial levels. And we're talking about significant temperature increase being like 2 degrees centigrade, which appears very small, but if the world has an average of 2 degrees centigrade temperature increase in Africa, this is going to be multiplied, amplified to maybe four degrees, two or two, three degrees, four degrees or above. Uh, what, this has direct impact to the people and to the environment. Because already we're having serious drought issues in the Sahel area, so the drought will intensify. The desert, there will be more areas coming under desertification, and we're going to still have floods in some other areas. So there'll be food shortages, crop failures, water shortages, uh, climate refugees from different parts migrating both to Europe and to other parts of Africa, they're going to be total chaos on the continent. And th this problem is compounded by the fact that the amount of resilience already built in the system on the continent to withstand this kind of challenge is very little. And so you have a continent that did not contribute historically or even currently to this, amount, this challenge that we're facing globally. 
And then you compare this to Northern Europe, I mean, North, North America and Europe, who have over the years of industrialization contributed heavy amount, virtually 80% of the atmosphere techno. The atmosphere is completely colonized. So what here in the Can Cancun discussions and in other climate discussions, the argument is about how to utilize the remaining 20% of the atmosphere. How to utilize it? Yeah, how, what to do with it. For me, I would say, look, don't put any more greenhouse gas into that space. This is what people with clear self-interest would do. Those who think about the future, who think about the survival of the planet. This is what we should be talking about here. How to move into an economic system that has zero or negative emission. But here are people here, they, nobody, the, the, the policy, the debates we are hearing is about not committing to make any serious emissions cut. I mean, the, the, the highest ambition we hear about from in Europe, for example, is 40% cut above, uh, of a cut in emissions above 1990 levels. Uh, that, that, seem, that is very modest. We're talking about something, we should be looking for something like 90%, 100 plus percent. But at least they put something on the table. So other countries are not doing this. Japan just said at the opening of the Cancun conference that they would not make any commitment uh, uh, in line with any binding treaty. In other words, no, they don't want to be held accountable. You know, every, the rich countries will say, okay, we, we will volunteer to cut emissions, but don't hold us to it. That's what is happening here. Wow. Now, in, uh, in Africa, it's very, you know, dependent upon the natural resources, the, the life, the trees, all of that. Is, is that already showing signs of degradation? Uh, no doubt, no doubt about it. The challenge of the impact of global warming, of climate change, is not a thing that would happen tomorrow. It's already happening. It happened yesterday. It's happening right now. People are losing their means of livelihood because of unusual floods, uh, because of water shortages, because of desertification. There are already climate refugees on the continent, moving from place to place. In my country, we're already having people displaced by climate impacts and also by impacts of destructive, extractive trans transnational corporations who are working the oil fields in the southern part of Nigeria. Do you think the climate impacts are going to increase fighting? wars um, uh, uh, the, the more if, if, if nothing is done to seriously tackle the climate crisis that the world is confronted with now if we think that there is time we can do this next year we can do this in next decade we can politicians think well we have a four-year term or two-year term I, I will just manage and get through and then whoever comes after me can take on this issue if politicians be, keep on playing politics with, the, with climate change, with human life and the future of the planet, we are going to get a situation when the issues will run away and they cannot be tackled anymore. This is, this is a very serious issue. For example, if polluting industries continue to pollute and then carry on with the fiction of carbon offsetting, you know, polluting somewhere else and planting a tree or buying a farmland or buying land, to store carbon somewhere else. If they keep on trading with carbon, making money with carbon without doing any action to stop the emissions, we're going to have a temperature increase that nobody will be able to adapt to, no matter how rich. I mean, for example, I've heard some people say, well, if the Arctic, Arctic ice breaks, we have good areas to navigate, to take our boats for vacation, or to go in there and drill for crude oil or whatever. That may sound fancy, but it actually means the demise of life as we know it. I ask myself really, what is the use of this kind of conference? Why do people come from around the world and spend two weeks talking when they know that nothing's going to come out at the end of the day? It, it sounds, it, it looks like we are a people, a generation who are drugged and we're sleepwalking or something. It's, comp it, it's not something that we can rationalize that intelligent people, top scientists and others, can gather in a way they know they would not reach an agreement to do anything. When I contrast this to what happened in Cochabamba in April this year, when people from around the world, popular movements met for two days, and we were all able to reach agreement in two days. 
But we have this discussion, this is the 16th session of the Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And yet they're not anywhere near. Every year the ambition drops. So if this continues, Africa is cooked. We are going to face a horrible future. And of course, the impact on Africa will resonate everywhere around the world. When you push a people from the natural environment that they depend on, that they live on, that they know, that they can cultivate, that they use, they've used over the centuries, when it becomes impossible for them to live there, they have to go somewhere else. Those who can go will go somewhere else. Cross the deserts, jump into the ocean. But I think we got to be ready to open the borders of every nation because people will have to find wherever it's possible to live. We're going to go into a cannibal, pardon the, the phrase, kind of civilization where the strongest the, will survive. But I, I hate to think that that would happen. But I think it's going to be a very savage regime in which people will have to pound on the doors of national borders and break down the walls. And unfortunately, we may have a global, a real globalized system, but that's not really what we need. We have the time now. Time is running out. This is time not just to consider individual national interests, but to look at the right of the planet, the right of Mother Earth. What, what, if there's one thing you wanted the general public around the world to know, what would it be? <laughs> if there was something I was going to tell the whole world. Yeah. Right now, after very deep reflections, I think what we need in the world and what everyone in the world should be conscious about is that the people must take back power. We have to take back political power. We have to formulate a system where progress and real democracy holds, where people articulate what they want and they make it happen. When we don't cede our sovereignty to a few politicians who occupy state houses and begin to be at the beck and call of transnational corporations, we've lost our liberty, we've lost our sovereignty. The world is now being run by corporations. Nations of the world have been colonized by big time corporations who are the polluters, they are driving policy, they are right here selling all kinds of false solutions and they are going to concoct more false solutions for tomorrow. So we need to recover sovereignty. If we do that, I believe we are on the way to saving our planet. Do you think we need something like a revolution? The revolution will not be televised. <laughs> Somebody says so. I, I, I think we certain, certainly um, we need some kind of revolution. It may not be an armed conflict, but we need people to stand up. We need mass movements. We need people to say, well, look, we've been running on the wrong platform. When we talk about climate finance, for example, people should be talking about the climate debt, ecological debt. Mother Earth has been raped for so long, people should pay for it. It's time to put back something, to build the resilience that is needed. Some set of people are not going to be condemned to just be adapting adapting to climate impacts or changes. It's going to get to a point that nobody can adapt. So this is time to cut the, the causes of these problems. So the revolution, we start with the revolution of the mind, the decolonization of the mind. We have to recover our memory that we are a people who can best survive in our planet, in the planetary solar system, when we work in solidarity, not in competition. The world is being run on the basis of competition right now. I'm stronger than you, I'm bigger than you, I have more money than you, I emit more carbon than you, but really what we should do is that we are living well on this earth. It's a way to the future. What, what would you tell people that are you know, stuck in the system and don't know what to do to you know, start taking back the power? We start by talking to one another, listening to one another forming social spaces, sitting down, having conversations about what is the essence of living on this earth. Is it about what you possess? Is, it, is there something beyond the individual? There's something that everybody can do. Sit down, have a conversation. Climate, you know, over the years, 
uh, from pre-industrial times to industrial age, a lot of the system we've, been, we've run in the rich countries has been highly polluting. And so you have greenhouse gases pumped into the atmosphere, and it's been calculated that the amount already there is almost too much. And if you put more, if you put 20, we have about 80% already taken off. If you put 20% more into the atmosphere, that you're going to have a situation where climate, global warming will get to an extent that you cannot control it anymore. And now we're talking about, the question is who caused this problem and who is suffering the impact? And so for every amount of harm that has been inflicted on the planet, there has been a direct link as also harm inflicted upon a certain sector, a certain set of people. And so those who have been bearing the impact all this while are being owed a climate debt by those who have been causing the impacts. And th this means not charity. It doesn't mean giving a grant. It doesn't mean giving a loan or using the World Bank to organize anything. Uh, it, it means that look, you've caused this harm and those who have been the victims need resources, they need technology to build resilience, to mitigate and to adapt. And this has to be paid. It's also in a certain sense a, a equal to the ecological debt. Um, the machineries and the civilization built in the north have been based on the resources taken from the south. And a lot of these resources are taken in a very destructive, non-caring manner. Not just destroying the environment, but also destroying the social fabric of communities where these things are taken from. The oil industry, the, the mining extractive industries, and all these kind of industries. And nothing has been put back to restore the environment that has been raped. And if, if we actually look at the value of what has been taken in terms of financial uh, value being put by those who took it, the value of what the extraction cannot restore the destruction, the degraded environment. So we have a situation where people have extracted in a very destructive way, gathered a lot of resources to themselves, and socialized and externalized the cost to the environment and to poor people and keeping them in poverty. And so those who have benefited, all those who have been expropriated and ecological debt, the same thing with the climate debt, they go hand in hand. So you find that actually, the poor, vulnerable people of the global south are the creditor people. They are not the debtor nations. These are the nations who are being owed by the global north. That's a great concept. Well, it's, you know, you will agree with me that it's not, it's not a fictional concept. It's no. more real than carbon trading. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy that, you know, now more and more delegates are beginning to talk about this, climate debt. Bolivia is championing it. The People's Assembly, the People's Conference on Climate and Mother Earth that met in Bolivia also championed it. The African delegations are championing it. The poor nations are talking about it. But who's going to pay attention to it? Yeah. That is the issue. But that's the first step. Talk about it. It's a, it's a good step. That policymakers and delegates can begin to talk about it. It shows that something is cracking. Yeah. And this is where the revolution starts. Changing the mindsets, changing the concepts, and realigning human beings to look at where we can work together.